Set Phasers, a highly illogical Star Trek podcast. the Lower Decks finale, and Stevie and Aki, your hosts, are here. I don't know why I started it that way. I liked it. It was it was very enthusiastic. I'm trying. Necessarily. I'm wearing my Star Trek robe. Yes, you are. Aki okay. got a Star Trek robe from one of his musical friends. Yes, I think this was probably... What's Phil Ray's first name? I don't know that. That's his first name. Phil Ray Bowles is his last oh. name. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Balls. Bowl. B O L L E S. Oh. oh, okay. Thought you said balls. No, I know. In a British accent, it would be bowls, but in American yeah, bowls. Bowls. Not balls. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear, we've already gone off the rails. We've gone wildly off the rails. Uh, well, listen, uh, I'm leaving for Europe in two and a half hours, but it's star date three three one zero one zero two point eight. And we are indeed going to talk about the season finale of Star Trek Lower Decks, The Stars at Night. Indeed. Stars at Night. But before we do that, we've got to talk about a little something called, or ask about a little something called Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> are you missing nerdy people in your life? Mm. Mm. Does your wife like the TV that you watch and you need some time alone? No. Do you need an excuse to go and sit in a dark room and watch some TV? That could have what? been somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah. Do you need some science fiction friends in your life? Well, look no further, friends, because right here, Stevie and Aki are here to welcome you into their Patreon community. Just join at patreon.com forward slash that phases for behind the scenes things. Early access to our videos, our audio episodes, Netflix watch parties, cooking with Aki, and more at setphases.com and patreon.com forward slash setphases. That's right. Oh, yeah. And after uh, after I get back from Europe, it's on. Yeah. There's going to be songs being written. There's going to be, I'm doing everything in this robe, cooking. Uh, the the Zoom watch alongs. We're gonna mm-hmm, do it all. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Robe yep. down. I just like the robe. It's a beautiful robe. Uh, thank you. It's very soft. Looks soft. Looks plushy. Thank you. I do try. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we should just run it down. I think it's a great idea. It's time to run it down. <laughs> Can you run it down <laughs> for me? And what just happened? <laughs> Can you run? Oh, Let me just collect my notes here. Move them around. Crack on, as they say. It's only two pieces of paper, but I'm trying to make it sound like a lot. <clears throat> Let me read from my comments. <clears throat> the, sh- the episode is called The Stars of Night. Look, here's how it goes, folks. You remember how the last episode ended? Uh, Mariner left the fleet. Uh, Starfleet altogether and became an independent archaeologist adventurer person with Preta, Yetta, Preya, Petra. Priya? Petra. Wow, should be so close. Uh, anyway, uh, the Cerritos was attacked by the Breen and their second contact mission on the planet of Breca. And this is why I'm having trouble Petra, Breca, Preya. And, uh, and, and so the ship is all jacked up and it's in dry dock and they were saved by the automated, the new automated Texas class brought forth by Admiral Buen Amigo. And so we begin with, yes. But Cerritos ironically, he is not a Buen Amigo. He, t- he is a well, Malamigo. Well, alert. Oh, sorry. What, you want the answer? Spoiler it? Oh, alert. damn it. Damn it. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Fuck. 
is it turns out Admiral Buen Amigo is actually an unadmiral uh, Malo Amigo. <laughs> Man, I wish I had come up with that content before. I could have really, could have really run with it. That's a pretty good idea. Um, yes. Well, before his inevitable betrayal, uh, Freeman and Ransom go before the Admiralty, and they talk about the failure of the mission. And Buen Amigo reveals that his big plan is to uh, get rid of the California class and replace them all with Texas class automated chips that can handle that kind of business. And so they're going to scrap it. And that's the whole plan. But, Ma but uh, Mariner. Captain Freeman says, no, 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 that will not do. And so in order to save the California class, she challenges Admiral Buen Amigo's Texas class to a, quote, mission race. A, a They will go through a gauntlet of, excuse me, of second class, uh, second contact missions. And whichever gets done faster, uh, will be the winner it's kind of we don't don't look too closely at this idea of a mission race the admiral is like yeah sure do a race to prove <laughs> that you should stay in starfleet meanwhile word has gotten out obviously to the people on the cerritos and they're all freaking out uh brad boiler unintentionally hurts shax's feelings by doing an impression of him just as he walks in the room and is behind him and now shax and boiler Oh, the relationship is strained and boiler doesn't want things to end that way but shax won't hear of it and there are tears in his eyes uh uh, we should jump real quick to Mariner, who is, uh, you know, stealing things from black market uh, Ferengi thieves and then returning them to museums. And she and Petra are on their ship together and they're having a jolly good time. Mariner does wonder, hey, where does all this money come from? How do you afford like all these missions and the ship and the fuel and stuff like this is not Starfleet? And Petra's like, hey, you just let me worry about the money and you worry about being dope. And Mariner's like, sure. But we know that Mariner's going to want to look into this one. Uh, she gets the chance anyway back to the the mission race it's a race and cerritos gets out ahead and buen amigo's like oh no don't worry uss alita let's let them get a little head start to see how well they do and so they go to one planet and they meet the people and they're setting up the stuff and just as they're about to finish setting up the stuff boom the alita shows up and drops it prefab on the ground and they go to another planet and they're trying to set up this, uh, you know, frontier laboratory thing. And the crew is really getting their work done. And then the USS Alita shows up and boom, drops a prefab thing on the ground. Done. But Tendi, in the meantime, discovers that there may be sentient life in the dust. And so they have to run a self-awareness test. Uh, and so they have to stop everything they're doing because it's Starfleet. It's one of the main things of what I was about to call General Order 1, but it's actually Prime Directive. Was it originally going to order on one, or am I getting it confused? With yes, different... I think it was. Okay. Just making sure I know what I'm talking about and which robe I'm wearing. And uh, they find out that it's a multiphasic sort of plant life, but uh, it's not sentient, so it's fine. They're able to finish putting their tower together. Meanwhile, the USS Alito has moved on to the final stop in the mission race, which is one of those planets that phases in and out of existence every some odd years or months or whatever and gets a delivery of supplies from Starfleet. And uh, the USS Alito gets there before them. The planet phases in. They drop all the stuff. The planet phases out. Phases out. The USS Alito sh shows up just in time to see the planet go away. And thus, they have failed to win the, the mission's uh, test race thing meanwhile this whole time rutherford has been distracted by the code for these sexy new ships because he's the only one on the ship as an engineer who's sort of like "Ooh, i mean listen it sucks that we won't have a job and that they're taking our place but ooh, look at these sweet sweet ships and he's checking out the code and there's something that's bothering him about it and as there's a little wrap-up conversation going on between uh freeman and buen amigos where freeman tries to say listen you may have beat us but you put a thing on the ground without checking to see if there's life first and Buen Amigo's like, yeah, it's a, it's a rounding error. Well, I can figure that all out. You still, we're going to get rid of the California class. Rutherford realizes what exactly that code is. It's <clears throat> his code. <laughs> Which, keep your hand on the button, means the shadowy Starfleet officer that had his memories erased was none other than Admiral Buen Amigo. And when confronted with this information by Rutherford while still on the line with 
Fre uh, Captain Freeman. Buen amigo admits it all and says it was all part of his plan the whole time, and that's why he wanted the second contact missions to fail, and the Cerritos is going to go down no matter what. And then in order to cover up his tracks, he decides he's going to give the USS Alito its complete autonomy so that it can attack the USS Cerrito and destroy them all. And he'll say that it was Freeman who attacked the ship in the first place, thus leaving his dastardly plans intact. I don't think there are any other bombs. That was That's pretty much all the revelations, right? Oh, my finger hurts from all that button touching. You know, we finally, we finally did it. We finally did it. Uh, yes, so... Freeman gives uh, Buen Amigo, when un, uh, what was I saying? Malo Amigo uh, gives the the USS Alito complete autonomy, and Rutherford tries to warn him, "Hey, this is the same code you used for me, and the code I used for Badgie, and it has serious parental uh, like hatred issues." And he's like, "Whatever, now go attack." the USS Cerritos, but instead the USS Alito turns around on him and says, I will burn your heart in fire and destroys Buen Amigo and then wakens and then wakens two more ships. I had to turn my page over. Uh, 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 I forget what their names are. I didn't write down all the names. A lot of city names in this episode. From Texas. <laughs> From, yeah, and then... Oh, forget. Yeah. What uh, is Corpus Christi for sure? Uh, and I forget what the third one is. Let's say pff, San Antonio. And so those I two ships. I think it was. Was it? Good job. Really? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Weird. And uh, uh, so the ships come out. And there's three of them. And they're destroying the station. And the and the USS Cerritos sees this happening. Goes, oh no, we've got to ward Starfleet. And uh, all this stuff is happening. And then Starfleet sends in another ship. And that ship starts to get attacked. And uh, the Cerritos has to figure out some way to take down these automated Texas class ships with a superior shield that you know people on board and are super fast. Meanwhile, back with Mariner and, and Petra, uh, they arrive and are delivering the icon or idol that they found. And Mariner says, hey, you know what? I'm a little too tired from running from those Ferengis from before, so you go ahead and party without me. Bring me back to Shake. Petra's like, no problem. As soon as she leaves, Mariner goes digging in to the uh, private uh, Petra's, Petra's private files. <clears throat> Petra's private portfolios. Petra's private portfolios. Uh, to find out who this, uh, who's backing these missions, Petra comes back, having forgotten her badge, of course, you know the old trope, and finds Mariner at work, and Mariner's like, oh, well, I had to know, I just, I wanted to know who's behind this, it's, this can't be good, it seems a little shady, and Petra's like, go ahead, take a look, see who's funding it, and Mariner finds out that it's from a healthy endowment from Captain Jean-Luc Picard, who, uh, who loves you know, archaeology or whatever. So that's how they make their money. They have a generous benefactor in the, the then, and that's it. But Mariner realizes, you know, I think I was just looking for a reason to go back to Starfleet. And Petra says, oh, you want to go back to Starfleet? That sucks. You want to go back to your stupid ship has been on the news all day. And Mariner's like, what? And she's like, check this out. And Mariner sees what's going on. And she's like, we have to go save them. And Petra's like, we can't. And Mariner's like, we have to because there are people. So they're rushing in to try and save the day. Meanwhile, back on the Cerritos, they decide they're going to do a desperate ploy. And uh, oh, way off from my notes. I'm just flying. I'm just freestyling here. Captain Freeman tells Rutherf uh, Rutherford and, uh, to to sort of claim that he has the code and can uh, get the USS Alito just just delete them as they they connect their comms to the ship and they talk to the ships and the USS Alito turns its bloodlust on the USS Cerritos Cerritos Alito. This is why it's a confusing episode to talk about. And then the three ships give chase to the Cerritos. They go into warp. They're gaining on the Cerritos and the Cerritos has to use extra warp power and it's one of those give her all she got kind of captain moments and they're pushing the engines as far as they can but they're still being tracked by the other ships and so they're all these you know the bridge crews on the bridge and then captain freeman says i need options how can we take these things out we're trying to buy starfleet some time everyone's throwing out suggestions none of them are working shacks mentions uh dumping the core which he mentions every time uh, it is a trope uh, whenever there's a problem and everyone ignores him but boy where stands up everyone shut up and listen to what shacks has to say we got to dump the core and captain freeman says he says that all the time but this time it could work because they drop the core behind them. They fall out of warp, which could be troubling, but they'll blow up the ships with the core in, you know, uh, in the process. And so Shax gets his greatest dream 
to to uh, to get rid of the core and uh, everyone is cheering as he goes into the turbo lift and walks through the halls or else yeah jack the core jack the core shack shack shacks and he goes down to engineering and phillips hands him one of the keys and they turn them together and they eject kapew and it falls out of the ship and the ship flies out of warp and spins wildly in space and there's an explosion and we think all is well except once the cerritos is stable once more they find out that the Alito has not been destroyed. The Alito is still there, and it begins to attack the Cerritos. Oh, mercilessly, almost destroying it. And so Captain Freeman's like, we're going to have to abandon ship. That's the only thing we can do. But Mariner flies in on Petra's ship just at that moment to say, belay that order. And Captain Freeman says, you can't save us, not with your one ship. And so Mariner says, that's why I called for help. And one more California-class ship comes in and Freeman's like, you two can't stop it. That's not enough to stop this one ship. And that's why Mariner says, I called them all. And all the California ships class, California class ships show up. I will not name all the California class ships, but there were many. All the many cities in California show up. It's a, a attack pattern, Delta full spread. They take down the ship. Uh, 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 and uh, all is well, cheering and happiness. Uh, to the end, Cerritos is getting a new core. Uh, Shax finds Boimler and says, hey, you helped me achieve my greatest dream. You're now part of the Bear Pack. So they've made up uh, Mariner and Freeman, Captain Freeman, reunite. And Captain Freeman wants to reinstate Mariner. Mariner's happy to do that. She doesn't necessarily want to be captain, but she does want to be part of Starfleet. And she asks specifically to be assigned the mentor of Captain of uh, Commander Ramson, uh, which uh, Ramson doesn't necessarily love, but it's great. And finally, Tendi, uh, who did such a great job under pressure, uh, is awarded uh, by her her mentor, uh, <laughs> Doctor Miglomel, uh, with a study buddy, a Vulcan by the name of Talin who she uh, immediately introduced to all her friends, and then everyone cheers. The end of season three of Star Trek Lover Decks. Let's chat about that. I say, darling, let's do a quick chat about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. please, yeah. Yeah. let's do. Remember when I used to throw my papers? I do remember that. I missed that. I'm so yeah. impressed you did that, having just watched it about 15 minutes ago. 15, 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, maybe it's because it's so fresh in my mind. I do mm. feel like I forgot a lot of things, subtext that I normally would look up. But, you know, that's the story as it happened. I thought it was a nice, a happy ending. I did, too. I quite enjoyed it. It was, an, it was a fitting finale. You got some closure on some things, some storylines. Yeah. A number of dangling threads. Uh, uh, Mariner and Freeman's... Rutherford. Uh, 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 yeah, Rutherford's uh, secret thingy thing. Mm -hmm. Tendi wanting to be a, uh, uh, you know, move up the ranks. in our officer training. Exactly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even Boimler uh, bonding with, uh, he now has a, what he calls a bridge buddy. Yes. In Shacks. So that was cute. It's also cute. Mm -hmm. And we got this new character to Lynn. That could be very fun. A Vulcan. Yeah, we haven't had a Vulcan really in Lower Decks who's been a main character, so that could be no. could be amusing. I'm sure there will be many shenanigans. Shenanigans? Uh, oh, shenanigans. Is, How the Vulcans yes. love some shenanigans. They love shenanigans, and I'm sure Talyn will be very disapproving of the shenanigans that the Lower Deck crew gets up to all the time. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else? I mean, I didn't see Buen Amigo as being the big bad guy, but I, I guess I should have. Didn't you? No, I I was like maybe it's Freeman's dad. I was uh, uh, Freeman, uh, Mariner's dad or something like that. Hmm. I only did at the beginning of the episode. By the oh, at the beginning you were like, this has got to be the guy. Something, did, yeah, yeah, this I, has got to be him. And I I think the last episode when um the Cerritos went to the planet at, and to Brecker, I thought he knew that they were going. Like. Mm -hmm. There was, I was like, but I thought he knew that. Like, he set up the whole, like, thing. So at that the point, I was like, yeah, yeah. He, he set it up. Uh, now that I think about it, we should have suspected him as soon as his name was Captain uh, Admiral Goodfriend. <laughs> yeah, right. It was uh, very much uh, uh, broadcast early on, because he's in episode one, mm -hmm. uh, when they're trying, when uh, 
Freeman is trying to get free from being told that she she destroyed Pac Man Planet. And his name is is Admiral Buen Amigo, and we should have known he can't be that point of an amigo. It's, it's kind of tough because he's not on the Cerritos, so we wouldn't have seen much of him. But I think like it would have been more of a Scooby Doo moment. I think if it had been him all along, you know. Right, and but also he he showed up a lot this episode this season. Yeah. So it makes sense. They like catch it. Was very you know what for a comedy show. That's about Star Trek. They did mm-hmm. all, they did just the right amount of like dramatic sort of like, you know, foreshadowing to give us the big bad as someone that we care about enough that the betrayal is truly a betrayal. Yeah. Uh, he also laughed yeah. like a maniac holding a cigar. And at that point I was like, this guy's probably the bad guy. Yeah. Anyone with a cigar in a movie, they're never good guys. But I really like what they, they tied all the things together. Mm, you know, it's a lot of dangling threads they put together this season. Dingle dangles. A lot of dingling and dangling, dingle dangles that they put to gangle. <laughs> this. Oh, <sighs> boy. I can't wait to get back to more shenanigans. Uh, do we have any uh, special Easter eggs or news? We certainly have some Easter eggs, oh. Aki. <clears throat> Hello and Leo. Welcome, to everyone who's listening to the, the Easter egg desk. We go immediately to Stevie Man's on the scene. Stevie, how are you today? Well, hi there, Aki. How are you? Good to be here. Good to be here. I'm coming to you live from the... the the Larry Dex rap party here in uh, oh yeah it's it's a fun time it's a fun time there's lots of things going on it's just crazy it's crazy Mariner's just she's getting drunk and she's on a bar she's having a a, a thumb wrestle with a Ferengi um you know, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. But we obviously have lots of Easter eggs uh, to talk about from the last episode. I do not know how to yes and that bit, but I liked it. Go on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so at the beginning, we have our Indiana Jones style escape. So it wasn't exactly an Easter egg for Star Trek, but uh, the relic was heading to Koilor, which may ring some bells for fans of the next generation, as Zakdorn, as Zakdorn's, I can never say this, a Zakdorn surplus depot is located in orbit of Quaylor 2 in the episode, one of our favorites, Aki Unification, mm-hmm. part one, uh, which was essentially a salvage yard for old starships, Federation and otherwise. So combined with their historical museum, later shown located on Quaylor 3, it's clear that the people in the system have a particular fascination for history and historical mm-hmm. items. Beautiful. Nice little fun part there. Um, uh, Billups was, uh, when we were getting ready for the, what do we call it, space race? Mission race. The mission race. Billups said uh, he wanted commander level data work and those isolinear chips had better be a blur, which was a fun callback, if you remember, to the Naked Now episode on Mm. season one of TNG, where. Everyone, it was, it was, which in itself was actually a callback to the Naked Now in the original season. And they all got a bit sort of high on some sort of pathogen that was in the air. Hmm. That was the one where Data and uh, Yar got together. Uh, Yar get, to, yeah, yeah. He's, I am fully functioning. And, I'm uh, fully and functioning. Whatever. Indeed. <laughs> um, he'll never live that down. No. Uh, not that no. he'd want to, right? <laughs> no, no, it was a great moment, but just very goofy. Yeah. <laughs> The Riker maneuver. How could we not get through this Easter egg update without talking about the Riker maneuver? So, uh, what, what's his face? Why have I forgotten uh, his name already? Thank you. Ransom was uh, speaking to his young cadets and he was telling them, you know, as everyone else was giving them, you know, helpful bits of information and like, let's get on with this and blah, blah, blah. And, and Ransom was like, okay, this is how you cross your leg over a chair um, before. So you cross your leg over the back of the chair before slamming into it, he said. Um, Now, obviously, fans everywhere, it wasn't a a thing Frakes developed for the character. Apparently, it's just an idiosyncrasy of his when he explained to fans at a convention in 2017 that it's not something he did consciously. According to him, his unorthodox move resulted from the combination of his six-foot-three frame and some very small chairs typically used in the series. Yeah. Now that I, you know, I consider it over these many years, him having to sit down the normal way would have been weird a bunch of times. Like all those little desks and little chairs, he would yeah. look so strange. He's getting his big 
frame in there and trying to sit down, but mm -hmm. pulling that maneuver, he really yeah. pulled it. Mm -hmm. And also the way he entered a room or left a room. Well, of course, with his head leading. Always. Yes, but you know, shoulders up or down, whatever. It was, it was always Shall amusing. Mm -hmm. Let's let's go. Deanna, Deanna, De Deanna. <laughs> <laughs> you really need to watch the video of this if you are listening in. Um, Freeman describes uh, the planet, I forget which one it was, Ockmenic 9, I think, as one of those oh, yeah. Brigadoon-type planets that exists outside of our reality and only phases into our dimension for a few hours a year. Now, that's fun for two reasons. For me, this is obviously a blatant reference to the 1947 Broadway musical Brigadoon about a strange Scottish village that only exists for one day a year. Um, oh. Thank you very much. But as Freeman suggests, this isn't oh, a phenomenon yeah. unique to Ockmenic 9. Uh, you may mm. recall, Aki, from the Deep Space Nine episode Meridian. The crew uh, of the USS, I? I know, the crew of the USS Defiant stumble upon the planet Meridian and uh, located in the gamma quadrant beyond the Bajoran warm wormhole. It's a world mostly exists in a non-corporeal state outside of our universe, but materializes for a few days every 60 years or so. So two bits of fun, Star Trek lore as well as Scott's lore. Huzzah! And huzzah! And also there's a lovely episode of uh, uh, Orville that has a similar plot. With a oh, that's true. That goes away into a different dimension or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was, that was, uh, the whole thing was lovely. Yes. Yeah. And finally, obviously, Picard's funding the Relic Hunters. So when Mariner mm. left Star Trek and she was uh, finding relics and returning them to museums, very Indiana Jones-esque, um, this would remind us of the Next Generation episode, The Chase, where we meet Picard's former archaeology professor, Professor Galen, and the Enterprise picks up his investigation of an ancient puzzle. The TNG episode Gambit even has Picard using Galen's name when he poses as a relic hunter. Um after being kidnapped by criminal bandits. So uh, it seems that once he made Admiral, he made a passion project to fund independent archaeologists on well, the we side. Know that Picard, he doesn't like to sit still. He likes yes. to stay involved. Um, so that's, that's everything I have here from the, uh, the, the rap party here at Lower Decks. I'll see if I can get any more gossip for you, Aki. But uh, for now, all that's it. And it's back to you in the studio. Thank you very much, Stevie. Don't have too much to drink or have one for me. And with that... I'll try. Bye. Okay. Doing shots, it looks like. Uh, and uh, let's go on to quotable moments. Quotable moments. I think I've gotten sillier in my old age, you know. Oh, do you? Yeah. Uh <laughs> You're hanging out with me and I'm wearing a robe. <laughs> the, uh, Indeed. It, it's 1.30 in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, I have a few quotable moments from this. Um, I really did like uh, uh, Boimler uh, doing his impression of Shax, and he says, I'm Shax, I talk about profits more than a Ferengi. It's very funny to me. Mm -hmm. uh, only because of the British accent that Petra has. <laughs> I, I don't know why, but I really love that she said, no, no, we can't go. At the, uh, we don't have to go out them. It will be a bloodbath. A bloodbath. Really? <laughs> a bloodbath? It will be a bloodbath. We can't. We can't do um, that, Mariner. It'll be a bloodbath in there. It'll, it'll be a bloodbath. It'll be a. It'll be a bloodbath in there. Is that <laughs> <laughs> an accent of any kind? Um, Whenever you try and do Cockney, it just goes wrong. It, I, it can't. I can't do it. It's very fun now. Uh, it, ooh. The um, <laughs> I uh, there's uh, oh yes, uh, Miglamo talking to uh, Tendi who is feeling a little down the drums. He says, Tendi, that's cantaloupe talk. I want you to be a cantaloupe. I mean, they're really, they're really working hard to keep Miglamo on task. I was going to say uh, on staff. Hello. Oh. Well, it's Paul of Tompkins, obviously, oh, no. and he's doing a lot of other voices. And the like little bit voices. Oh yeah, I've heard him. He was the admiral in the of uh, the the I think lieutenant in the last episode who who was throwing away the pies. Oh okay. <laughs> and he says I can't give you any pie. And he says oh. then done me. And he says I can't. That was definitely. Paul I wondered Tompkins. why because that was just so random. Otherwise, I had no. Yes. I had no. That was just not part of the plot in any way. 
definitely PFT. It was just about Rutherford's obsession with pies. Also, uh, the guy who plays Lieutenant Kayshawn, Carl Tart, has been doing. I've just, I, you know, I'm big on noticing voice actors. He's doing a lot of the bit roles too. I think he's one of the ca- California class captains that shows up at the end. Uh, and I also loved, oh, the speech that I forgot the cat's name, uh, gives at the very end of the episode. She says, today we faced impossible odds, but together we kicked impossible's ass, which is, that's got, I hope that's the t-shirt for episode 10. Yeah. <clears throat> I have I one. No, oh, I have one. Rutherford, he said. He used my designs, my code. <gasps> That's the same code I used for Badgie. And then Tendi oh. says, oh, no, a starship can't have daddy issues. Yes, indeed. That was probably one of the most terrifying moments in the whole episode was mm-hmm. that there was the code for Badgie. Uh, yeah, that's it. I guess we go to next time now. Let's <laughs> do it. Next time on Set Phasers. <laughs> I've been consolable. Next time on set phases, what will we do? Uh, well, we'll be uh, we'll figure something out to talk about. We will uh, figure something out to talk about. I'll write a song that goes like that. And uh, yeah, listen, if you're if you're hankering for a little uh, rundown and discussion and quotable moments from other Star Trek episodes, we have a bajillion, jillion, jillion back episodes for all the episodes of Star Trek Discovery, Star Trek Picard, uh, first season of Strange New World, the past two seasons of Star Trek Lower Decks. We are on it. Uh, even when we now have two hours before we have to get on a plane to go to Europe because we give a damn. You understand me? So find us wherever you get your podcast from. We are there. And if you want to get on Apple Podcasts and give us a little review and a little, you know, some, some stars, Love. that wouldn't hurt either. Yeah, yeah, please do that. And of course, you can find us on patreon.com forward slash set faders. If you want to need nerdy friends in your life, me and Aki and the rest of our Patreon crew are there for you. Patreon.com forward slash set phasers. We also have social media. Uh, we're on Instagram, uh, Set Phasers Podcast. We're also on the Face Place, Set Phasers Podcast. Uh, excuse me, Meta <laughs> with uh, Set Phasers Podcast. Uh, so you can find us there and be cool and interact with us. Being game strong, it's all Stevie. Well, what a season! It's time for a little a little breaky break, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks when Aki returns from Europe. Until next time, I am Stevie Mans. And I've dreamed of this moment for so long. Eject. <laughs> Computer. <laughs> <laughs>